um, in the second stages of this project that was more for a uh, focus on looking at the ethical implications of technology and ICT tools uh, and the process of informed consent. So, um, we uh, produced a report, as Dimitri said, last year uh, uh, that was uh, aiming to provide an analysis of uh, an identification and an analysis of all the of potential ethical uh, privacy and data protection uh, issues uh, but for this we wanted to really keep a comprehensive approach we wanted to uh, include a wide variety of perspectives as uh, were being discussed in the in the literature so we were not selective we just uh, wanted to 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 really um, look into everything that is being discussed, what are the technologies, what are the pros and cons, and kind of identify those factors that seem to determine whether a, a set um, technology is going to be successful or not. So with this purpose in mind, we conducted a review of the existing literature. We, can, uh, we reviewed of over 100, well over 100 sources, and where with the we uh, with the idea of really determining whether technology had the potential to solve some of the problems that we identified in the early stages of the project as problematic with the traditional uh, formats of informed consent so i won't go again through the problems because i think javier uh, has already covered most of them and and also we are behind the schedule so but just <clears throat> briefly saying that as you know uh, the informed consent is, uh, presents a lot of issues in terms of uh, comprehensibility because it's using often the form or traditional formats use a very legalistic approach uh, which is difficult comprehension. Then, um, so there is no real uh, established standards to determine how how the participants' characteristics such as age or cultural background should influence how information is disclosed. There are differences in the way different cultures understand uh, the informed consent process, purely possibly uh, related to, how, uh, to their difference in understanding the concept of autonomy. Um, and of course, there is a whole other uh, set of issues that uh, relate to data protection and confidentiality requirements that are most exacerbated now with the entry and simple support of the GDPR. But I'll discuss that at, uh, later and definitely we will delve into that in session two this afternoon. So, um, it, we in our research, we wanted to, uh, as I said, we identified uh, those technologies and we, uh, uh, we grouped them into four categories. Um, we didn't want to exclude those uh, innovative approaches that were more uh, directed at uh, improving the informed consent form. Um, uh, but uh, so we also included so those technological, non-technological steps that or approaches or techniques that wanted to make a, a aiming to uh, make the informed consent simpler and shorter, using lay terms or simple language, uh, a tired, tiered approach um, to the way information is disclosed, and using visual support to communicate key information uh, tailored to different the characteristics of different special groups such as children, uh, elderly, or different cultural, uh, different cultural groups. Um, so the second category would be the ICT tools or multimedia tools that use more than one means of presenting information to participants, um, such as a video, audio, a podcast, so on and so forth. Um, we found that the literature reports that there are a number of benefits associated with this technology, possibly because they make the information more accessible to the individual and it also gives them the opportunity to review the said information as often as they need it and choose whatever format they feel more comfortable with. Um, also another advantage of these tools is the fact that they can, the, we, we, um, it can be monitored how the um, how the participant actually uses the tool, which uh, could have could be helpful to determine um, or to assess the comprehension, the comprehensibility. So whether the participant has been actually able to understand what he's read. Um, so that's uh, it present. Uh, so that's a uh, benefit. 
Um, the type of technologies here would uh, include the interactive computer-based technologies where the participant gets to interact with the technology that is being used. And this uh, number of benefits here because it, propo it promotes the engagement and the participation of the participant uh, in the process of uh, receiving the information and it also enhances comprehension. Here also we find, uh, we, we, we grouped under this category, we grouped the, uh, the concept of electronic concern. Uh, I think we might be, you might be familiar with this because it has gathered quite a lot of uh, interest from the research community in the, in the last year with a lot of pharmaceutical industries actually implementing it in their in the in the research and also relies on the on electronic systems and processes uh, such as audio video podcast text everything and also interactive uh, tools uh, in order to pass on the information and to obtain the documents um, from the participants um, some of the benefits here is of course besides the fact that they promote the engagement and participation and improve the comprehension of the information is that it helps with the um, with the process of uh, and, uh, streamlining the administrative aspects, uh, administrative aspects of the informed consent process um, the second category uh, sorry the second category would be those associated with the dynamic consent which we'll definitely be talking about later on in more detail in the first session um, so the dynamic consent were uh, relates to platforms that were originally developed in the context of biobanking and it's a very good idea because it's uh, it, it really um, allows uh, the idea of informed consent being considered a process rather than just a one-off event uh, in the sense that it allows to uh, communicate information to the participants uh, from the beginning until the end of the study um, and also allows the participant to manage their, their preferences on how they want to be uh, contacted and whether they want to give consent to, to certain projects or certain new uses and also um, alter any other choices. So there is a number of benefits uh, for this, which includes um, uh, improving recruitment, enrollment and retention and the better management of the trial in general. Um, this for last category of innovative approaches where uh, we're looking into those uh, techniques that aim at improving the impact of uh, training given to researchers and healthcare professionals. Uh, so as we know, as we discussed earlier with Javier, um, uh, uh, it's very important that the researchers understand uh, their role in the communication process. So the fact that there are technologies out there such as mobile phone applications that um, are intended to improve the impact, not just the fact, not just to give training, but pro, uh, uh, maximize the impact to the of, of these training programs. It's very positive and could really help um, improve uh, the, the the dynamics between the patient and the, the and the researcher relationship. So um, of course, it's all very good so far. We identified a lot of benefits, but then. Uh, for what concerns us, we wanted to really determine uh, whether there will be uh, a downside to, to all these technologies. And indeed, we found a number in the in the we found a number of ethical issues being reported in the literature. And most of these issues were I will work, I will go through them quickly into categories. So uh, we found that the. Um, the, there might be problems uh, with uh, just moving or transposing uh, problems associated with traditional formats uh, of informed consent now into an online context. So here we found a strong, we encounter strong criticism with the practice of consent by clicking or clicked contracts, uh, which relates to um, when an individual incurs contractual obligation by clicking, uh, con uh, clicking to consent on an online Format without actually having read any terms of conditions, any term, any the terms of conditions, or really understanding what they are uh, getting themselves into, so to speak. So we thought that some of this criticism could be extrapolated to the uh, informed through the clinical trial context, 
Um, because uh, there is a recognition that uh, in the in the informed consent context in clinical trials, uh, there is uh, there are a number of issues with ensuring that the the patient or the participant actually genuinely understands uh, the information that they receive. So um, this criticism of clicking by consent of consent by clicking, sorry, uh, could be have a, an impact uh, as more technologies are developed in this regard. And of course, if we consider the rapid increase in ICTs and the big data processing, uh, this problem of uh, communicating information becomes even more pressing because as we will discuss later, uh, there is a, this makes it even more difficult to actually communicate to the participant how their uh, data is going to be processed at, uh, or how we are going, they are going to use their data in uh, later on. Um, so it's not a mass, it's not only a, a, a problem of how, how information is given, but also how often. With platforms such as the uh, dynamic consent or broad consent, there are a number of problems uh, have been raised and we will definitely touch on that later on. I'm sure, sure Sorem has a lot to say about this. Um, the fact that he, it's uh, not clear how often it's acceptable or ethical to go back to the participant to request to renew their consent, uh, reconfirm their participation, because this could, there is a risk that this could create a, a uh, con uh, concert fatigue or become the process of consenting as a routine activity in their daily life that could uh, perhaps diminish the seriousness of the of the decision to continue in a clinical trial. Um, there is a number of issues of course related to autonomy and whether a, a technology has the potential to protect autonomy in the online context. Um, here it's mostly relating to technologies that seem to equate the concept of autonomy to whether an individual is able to make a decision independently by themselves rather than as it's uh, understood in, uh, from an ethical point of view rather than being uh, empowered or given all the, all the information that is necessary to make a decision that is genuinely informed. So here we found some that the, the over reliance on certain types of technology that are aiming to make the participant uh, explore their their decision uh, their their options uh, on their own make uh, could create a negative impact uh, because it detracts from what we really understand as autonomy. Uh, into more make, making sure that they are able to make the decision alone. Um, also here is the, we found these uh, problems with the concept of nudging, of how technolo uh, technology or the choice of architecture in the designing process of a technology could have um, and uh, could influence or influence the decision making of the participant by making certain aspects more appealing uh, to the participant. Um, uh, other issues were associated with monitoring comprehension. So, as we said earlier, some, most of those platforms uh, allow to monitor how the participant actually uses the tool, which could perhaps be equated to uh, how these are uh, in an online environment, uh, how um, a problems of online surveillance. So, there is a risk that uh, too much monitoring could become uh, could come into conflict with the rights of the uh, to privacy of the participant um, next is the fact that by removing uh, the human factor or the personalized face-to-face -to -face discussion with the researcher there is a high risk that the comprehension and the trust uh, could be affected uh, the trust in the in the research team could be affected, which um, we know as it's the golden standard uh, in most of the ethical uh, guidelines, uh, existing guidelines that recognize that the face-to-face -face consultation is the golden standard of clinical care and it has a number of benefits associated with it. So um, technology that is developed to substitute instead of a support this exchange could uh, perhaps have a very negative impact on the well-being and uh, the autonomy of the patient. 
for the participants. Um, then there is the discussion between whether broad consent versus dynamic consent in the context of biobanks. This for sure will be dealt with later. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say at this point that there are a number of issues associated with the um, the fact that a consent can uh, there are platforms that can be that extend over over a certain period of time for certainly for the whole duration of the clinical research um, such as broad consent um, where the patient donates their biological material or data and give consent to to it being used uh, in whatever way by the by the researchers for as long as there are, it complies with certain conditions such as anonymization good governance uh, review of the uh, ethics committee etc but uh, in the context of big data and the more and more digitalization uh, in the context of the clinical trial um, we've uh, found a lot of concerns about whether coding or pseudonymization is actually possible because there is a high risk of um, re-identification re uh, of the patient of the patient's data. So for this, we found that the dynamic consent was proposed as a suitable alternative, but as we will be discussed later, the dynamic consent also comes with some downsides, such as the consent particular preconization that we've already talked about. Um, there has been a proposition that uh, a suitable alternative for this could be meta-consent, um, but this is something that we will discuss later. So, and I'm sure it will make it more clear, uh, Soren Home will make it more clear than, than me right now. And then one last issue that is actually very important is the fact that uh, it's very difficult to control in an online environment the quality of the information that the participant is able to access. So this is uh, what's been called the Dr. Google problem. And it is, uh, uh, it, it, is it creates a number of issues that, um, in so far as uh, it's diff once uh, you give the participant the possibility to to handle information in an online environment, there is a higher risk of in unreliable information being um, entering uh, or being considered or be uh, taking part in the deliver in the decision making process which could intoxicate their deliberation procedures for the participants. And this is something that we've seen, and it's very real with certain groups such as um, anti-vaccine groups and everything that is all this information that is being circulated online and how um, actually it do have the impact of effect quite significantly and quite remarkably uh, how the participants actually consider their options, uh, deliberate about their options before they actually have to make a decision uh, about whether to participate or not. And lastly, I have, uh, a number of issues have been identified with regard to data protection, anonymization, confidentiality, uh, exacerbated once again by the entrance into force of the GDPR. Um, uh, so here, I will not go so much into the details because this is a, quite a big focus of this session this afternoon. But it's sufficient to say that this interplay between clinical trials regulation and ethical standards, uh, it's not clear how these informed consent uh, standards in the, from an ethical guidelines point of view now interplay with uh, consent as a legal basis for processing data under the GDPR. Um, there was for a long time an assumption that it was the same, that you could not process health data without the consent of, um, of the participants. But now, since last year, the European Data Protection Board, uh, which, if you don't know, is uh, the, the supervisory authority, data protection authority uh, at the European level that uh, issues and uh, interprets standards of the GDPR. So they've, made, they've issued an opinion where they found that um, informed consent under the clinical trial regulation and informed consent under the GDPR are completely different things. 
so um, and the two standards are not to be mixed so you could actually process data relying on a, a participant health data uh, by using other uh, legal legal grounds so this has created a number of ethical issues that we cannot uh, figure out so this is why we call you all here one of the reasons why we call you here so we can find shed some clarity and some light over what actually is the standard and what are the ethical implications of separating the two consents 